Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And the, um, the next panel is going to discuss the power of civic engagement in addressing societal challenges. And I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Larry Donnelly, who is um, from Boston, Boston-born, and is with the I political columnist with the journal. Then we have Ann Darty. Ann Darty is the CEO of Cork City Council. Lynn Ruan. Lynn is the president of the Student Union in Trinity College, Dublin. Liam Hannaway. Liam is chief executive of Newry Morn and Down District Council. And we also have the um, Deputy Lord Mayor of Belfast, Guy Spence. There we go. I'd also like to give another hand to Fusion. That was a wonderful performance. And probably very appropriate since um, the reason Sister Cities International was started. It was started um, by President Eisenhower on September 11th, 1956. And if the problem was that we weren't getting over the, our issues after World War II with the countries of Germany and Japan. And his idea was he brought together the White House Conference on Citizen Diplomacy. His idea was to encourage people to meet each other face to face. And hopefully that would deter conflicts in the future. And I think everyone can say that works pretty well. Because today, just 60 years later, think about that in the history of time, that's a very small amount of time. Some of our biggest trading partners and our strongest allies are now Germany and Japan. So I think the idea of civic engagement um, is uh, one of the most important things that he came to understand, that in order to have peace and prosperity, we needed to meet each other. So that's our history. Now our future, one of the things that we're working on with Sister Cities International is outreach to the uh, Middle East and North Africa countries. Because frankly, we have to step out of the box and as President Eisenhower asked people 60 years ago to get out of their comfort zone, we also have to do the same. So um, now I'd like to start with you, uh, right. Mr. Donnelly. Okay. And Is, you like Is his mic on? Can you hear me? There okay, you can now. Thanks very much. Uh, first, just want to echo the comments just made. Uh, I think it's really a hot act to follow. Fusion were absolutely terrific. We were just listening outside, and it was amazing to see. Um, I want to also say what a pleasure it is to be here and to talk about two things uh, that are very near and dear to my heart and to my head, uh, and that's the transatlantic relationship uh, and civic engagement. Uh, and I think first, just with respect to the, the transatlantic uh, relationship, I suppose my involvement in that comes down to conversations I've had with several people here today uh, when they ask me where I'm from, and I say I'm from Boston, they say, okay, what day did you get here? And I say, oh, about 15 years ago. Uh, so uh, I suppose my life has been a bit of the transatlantic relationship. Uh, and second, since I've been here, I've been fortunate enough to work in the field of civic engagement, something uh, I believe in very deeply. Uh, and I've done so uh, as a lecturer and as director of clinical legal education in the National University of Ireland, uh, Galway, uh, in the School of Law. Uh, and I'm very proud uh, to have been there. Uh, I suppose first couple things just to say uh, is naturally uh, one of the things I think is great about sister cities is their capacity to drive uh, transatlantic, the transatlantic relationship and new transatlantic relationships, I suppose, uh, as we're constantly trying to reinvent what already is a very special uh, bond between uh, Ireland and the United States. Uh, and I know that Boston and Belfast, Boston with the help of our great mayor, uh, Marty Walsh, uh, and a number of people in Belfast who supported the initiative for many years, uh, now, or for several years now, are sister cities. Uh, and I note even today uh, that there's a lot of people in Belfast for a tech center uh, conference. I know there's a large contingent of Boston people there, and I think it's great, and I think it's emblematic of all the things uh, that we can do through sister cities. Uh, one of the things we were asked to do was to come up with some ideas or think about, uh, I suppose, the future, as Mary said. Uh, and again, 
I know that the next panel is speaking about education, so I don't want to get too deep, but I'm going to talk about, uh, I suppose, education just from a specific angle and, and with specific reference to civic engagement. Uh, and maybe a, a lot of this is probably already going on, but I want to applaud to the, the extent to which it's going on, but maybe add a little bit of a different wrinkle uh, that I think might be worth exploring for sister cities uh, as we continue these bonds and try to grow them. Uh, and again, uh, I suppose, you know, with, with respect to, you know, as we know in the U.S., the college and university sector, or what would be known here uh, as the third level sector, uh, really I want to talk about uh, my vocation, I suppose, which is law, uh, and my avocation, uh, which is politics and government, uh, and to students, I think, in both. Uh, and one of the things I think might be useful to do, and again, this is uh, in addition to what I, I'm sure is already going on, uh, is in terms of sister cities and the educational institutions that are based uh, in, within them uh, and to explore, uh, I suppose, more uh, and greater, uh, I suppose, exchange programs, et cetera, and to, to be, to assist, for sister cities to drive these, uh, I, I suppose, exchanges between institutions in the two, uh, in the respective cities, uh, and to do so uh, also not just in terms of pure educational exchange, but also to look at civic engagement as a part uh, of the curriculum as a part of the educational experience students receive. It's something uh, that I think is growing significantly. Uh, and specifically, uh, if we were to talk about politics and government, for instance, uh, and I think in terms of these exchange programs that, that already got educational exchange, uh, one of the things I think would be particularly useful would be for students uh, on both sides of the Atlantic to work uh, uh, with organizations and with government, governmental bodies, et cetera, uh, to focus on things like increasing involvement in the political process, uh, especially, especially for people uh, marginalized and disadvantaged groups uh, on issues like voting, uh, participation in the democratic process, uh, I think that would be very, very useful. And again, in terms of embedding relation, relationships between sister cities, I think would be potentially very useful. Um, from a legal point of view, from, a law, from the, the law side of things, uh, and again, when I speak of clinical legal education, I speak of uh, a movement that really emphasizes uh, law students working uh, with uh, organizations, again, that serve those who don't have the means, who don't always have access to justice, or whose experience uh, of the justice system is not a good one, uh, and provision of, law, of legal assistance, again, through organizations, through uh, legal aid, et cetera, in a variety of different ways uh, for students to become uh, involved uh, in that sense. And again, it's just a key to see uh, on both sides of the Atlantic the myriad challenges that we have in terms uh, of making sure that the law and legal system uh, work for all and that all have access to justice. Uh, and I think this is very important to, to get uh, a point because there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. And I suppose, uh, and again, I know that the educational exchange is a huge part of sister cities, but sister cities' involvement in this, I suppose, through building relations, stronger relationships with universities and really pushing this uh, as part of the agenda. Where I suppose I have a little bit of a new wrinkle, uh, and this comes down to one of the great things about the transatlantic relationship, and that is uh, the free flow of immigration. Uh, and I know that it's immigration laws have been restrictive uh, on both sides, but what this might lead on to, what, exchange, what extended, uh, I suppose, exchange programs and particularly internship programs, uh, whether in politics or government and law, might lead on to was the exploration of potential for fellowships. Uh, went to, to avail of the one-year graduate visa, which goes from one side of the Atlantic to the other. Uh, st Irish students can avail of it in the United States. U.S. students can avail of it in Ireland. Uh, and the potential for one-year fellowships uh, for students who, have, who were awarded them uh, and then choose, to, based on their experience of having done an internship uh, as a student, that they can then come uh, on a fellowship and hit the ground running for a year uh, and make a very real difference, I think, uh, to the work, uh, again, whether it's getting uh, people involved politically or getting them engaged in government or uh, ensuring greater access to the legal system on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, I think there's a real value added there. And again, I think it's another way sister cities uh, can help to drive this through the myriad contacts they already have with the educational institutions uh, in their backyard. Uh, I think just three ways uh, I think that this, you know, again, uh, can help embed the transatlantic relationship and help further uh, civic engagement in this context. Again, it makes sister cities in the, as an organization an even more visible and even more active, uh, I suppose, actor uh, in this area, which is absolutely important and makes a real tan can make a real tangible difference. Uh, secondly, uh, I think Irish, Irish students uh, who are exposed to exchange, uh, the exchange system and then ultimately perhaps uh, to a fellowship uh, would get to see how U.S. cities, which have long been 
uh, multicultural, long been multiracial, uh, how they address the needs of new Americans, okay, something uh, that they do to, to you know, their, their successes and their failings, but to see how they do that, and I think that's especially important uh, in an increasingly uh, multicultural uh, and multiracial island, uh, that to see how things are done and maybe what perspectives there might be uh, from that, okay, and third thing, uh, I think in terms of U.S. students, uh, and again, I can say these things because I once was uh, a 21-year-old insular American student, uh, for them to get an idea, uh, both, uh, I suppose, as undergraduates through uh, extern intern internship programs uh, in Ireland as part of uh, study abroad or whatever exchange mechanisms there might be, to see how things are done elsewhere in the world and to get a sense, which I think is vitally important, uh, that the world and the best way of doing things isn't just confined to American shores, that there's a big world out there. And I think that's a very, very important lesson they can learn. So the observatory is a place where kids, their parents, the citizens of Cork and their families can come together and experience what I call the art of space, of mystery, of the stars. It has an educational focus, but it also brings young people and their families into that great world we all talk about now, STEM, or now we want to call it STEAM. So where is our pipeline for talent coming from? It has to come from STEAM. So the observatory is a key part of that. So the next part of the development, and the sister city is part of this, was the development of a project called a Tara Project, where we have telescopes in San Francisco, in Berkeley, but also in a school in San Francisco. So the kids in Black Rock Castle, in our observatory, can look at the night stars in California during the day in Ireland, and the kids in San Francisco can look at the night stars over Ireland during the day in California. So it's bringing STEAM right into the heart of the community. It's bringing that pipeline and interest in what we both share is that technological-based industry in both our cities. So it's a little example about how the sister city relationship with different people working across different levels, at society to society, at business to business, education to education, civic authority to civic authority, can come together and put something together that's a little bit different, is a little bit quirky, but can bring a pipeline for talent into both our cities simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Mm. What a great project. That's fantastic. Mm. Thank you. Lynn. Um, good afternoon. Um, I suppose my, my story in terms of looking at civic engagement is it's much more local and it's probably much more of a struggle just in terms of, you know, people from background like mine from very deprived areas um, sometimes often don't know what it is to be a citizen and engage in that way. So it can be a bit of a fight to actually realize how you can engage or to even gain the education or the language to begin to engage as a citizen. Um, the importance for me of civic engagement, it, it, exceeds, it exceeds charitable donations or gaining experience or even the participation bit. But for me, it's about self-empowerment. Um, it's something that I consider crucial to affect change. And civic engagement can provide a person with the necessary confidence and skills in terms of third level education. Um, at, at a very young age, I suppose, I see myself as engaged in, in citizenship uh, more in terms of challenging the system, which also can mean that you're actually disengaging to civically engage, which is kind of two things happening. So you're engaging saying, I'm not happy with this situation, so I'm going to disengage and do something with it. But that also, in the broader picture, is you, know, you becoming a citizen and, and challenging the community around you. Um, I left school very, very early and um, as a mother at 15, and I went on to um, study addiction. And I developed addiction programs for a very, very uh, young age. But when, after the economic collapse in Ireland, um, I realized that you know, there was a lot of important work happening in the community sector, but it was just completely decimated by cuts. And something I realized at that point was that I could no longer engage in the process of advocating for those communities because I didn't have an, an, an education and because I didn't have a language. And I was locked out of that debate of being able to create any further change. I could create it on a very individual level, but I couldn't create it on a mass level um, in terms of protecting community programs or protecting uh, the underprivileged within society. So I decided the best place to get that 
ability to kind of um, engage as a citizen on, on a much more national level than so localized was in Trinity College. Um, and, and that's where I went. And um, I've spent, I'm, I've, I've studied politics and philosophy, but last year I ran for the student union president, um, which is not, it's not normal for, for a 21 year old single mother from the area that I'm from. <laughs> And so they were all quite surprised, but have embraced it. Um, and my whole kind of project for the past year was to try and bridge the gap between the social classes. Um, there's only 25% of students in Trinity College that are on a state grant, um, which is very, very low compared to other colleges. And to just remember where it's located, it's located in the city center in, in a beautiful building, a stone's throw away from some of the most deprived areas in the country and they don't even realize that they can walk through those gates and, and, and that you know how can somebody begin to engage if they don't even realize they have access to a building that's actually on their front door and um, so one of the programs I, I've, I've committed me past year to very much being a very much a campaign and president and trying to get students socially uh, mobile and um, students are at the most idealistic and um, before they become much more cynical as they get older so I felt it was prime time to get in there and um, so one of the programs, just to give you an idea of what, I, what I've been doing and how I see civic engagement being, being effective, was I developed a program around access to education where I got sick of walking through Trinity College and seeing children from Dublin and from different parts of Ireland being shown around Trinity College like a tourist, looking through the windows, not actually knowing that this is somewhere there they can, where they can um, engage and, and be part of. So, I developed a program whereby those children no longer got the tours around Trinity like the tourists did, but they engaged for the day. And they had mini lectures with students who gave up their time all year from very privileged backgrounds. They taught them about what it was like to be an engineer, and um, what it was like to study zoology, and they sat in a lecture theatre and tried to do away with some of those scary myths about what it's like to be in college. Um, I got the college then to come on board and the science gallery would give them private tours. The sports centre would bring them in um, to, to go on the climbing wall. So they would very much experience what it was like to be a student and it meant they got to mix then and the classes were mixing. And I think, you know, the, the students that got behind it and got involved really committed um, the whole year to, um, you know, creating a greater relationship with the very underprivileged schools within their area. Now I finish in two months and the, the college has vowed to take this on to, to keep it going and that, that would be just one of the things. Another, another form of engagement and civic engagement that I'd be involved in, uh, is this, yeah, I suppose it is, but it's around the, the divestment of fossil fuels, um, which is something that it becomes much more global. Um, I'm a, I'm, I think we're on the verge of divesting, which will be amazing, um, which, but we won't know for the next two months. But students have set up like, you know, Skype calls and conversations with students from all around the world and it's became very much a global movement in terms of, in terms of climate change. And I really believe it's, it's um, the responsibility of every generation to ensure the generation of the next and climate change is a massive way of doing that. Um, so that would be a kind of most of the things I have to say on, on civic engagement. Other than it's a very outdated word, I think most people like to call it like activism now or, you know, so I think we need to change the term a little bit. Um, so, but one thing I'll just leave you with is that um, I suppose for me, when we find ourselves in, in a position of, of privilege, which I have, I mean, I'm running for, for the Senate, which is one of the most elitist and undemocratic positions in the country. And um, I know why am I going for it yet, but I felt, you know, I might as well challenge it in that, in that way. Um, but I feel when you find yourself in a, in a position of privilege that it's your civic duty to leave no one behind. And I suppose that's what we, if we all commit ourselves to that, that when we actually move class or social class or social mobility, or, or we end up being, um, you know, um, wealthy or just even secure in our own jobs, that it really is our civic duty just to leave no one behind. Thank you. It seems as though we have a common theme of students and a lot of technology, too. Um, we work with that at Sister Cities International, and actually we have a wonderful program. Just a quick story. San Diego, California, has a um, relationship with Jalalabad, Afghanistan. And every month, they have a Skype session between high schools where they come in, and that's the way you open 
kids' minds, is that they actually get to see each other and ask each other questions about what their lives are like. So, um, Liam, if you'd like to continue. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I suppose when I, when I looked at the, the challenging topic here in terms of societal challenges, I started to think of really the, the, how society is challenged across the board. And I suppose society can be challenged in several ways. It can be challenged across the whole region. So the whole issue we had in terms of the depression, the recession over the last six or seven years affected every community across Northern Ireland. But again, if we think of it ourselves in terms of the troubles within our own particular areas, civil unrest, issues, deaths, and some of the troubles identified particular challenges within local societies. So I suppose what I see is that challenge, uh, society can be challenged at different levels. And the role of the civic leaders, and again, I come from a local government perspective, has got to be as how we uh, address them challenges at different levels. And I suppose I would say to the whole period of the Troubles, the one constant in terms of democracy within Northern Ireland was the role of the local council, the role of the local government. And we had 26 councils at that point in time. And I suppose we've seen a change, and there's been a challenge to our society and the local government, because local government has become smaller. So we now have 11 councils where we had 26 councils going, forward, going behind, uh, sort of pre-April uh, 2015. So I suppose that also sets a challenge for us, and I, I, I think members of our own councils would see that. I work in, a, in an area, Newry Morning Down, which really takes on board some of the suburban areas of Belfast. So Banla Hinch people that come from Northern Ireland, Banla Hinch, Sainfield, which really house a lot of people who actually work in the Belfast area. But also the far side of my district sees me with Colleville, Crossbill Lane, Cork Hill, which all look to the south, and it's interested in PayPal. A lot of people in the South Arm area working in PayPal in Dundalk because they see Dundalk as a local connection. And that creates a challenge for, for our local elected members. And I suppose, as I said to you, really, during the Troubles, local members, local councillors, played a critical role in terms of leading within these particular challenges. And when they look at the new councils coming together, they realise that if we're working in such a diverse area, whereby you have Newry City, you have a town of Downpatrick, about an, uh, um, an hour's drive from it, you have suburban areas of Belfast, and you have rural areas, is how do you f engage with all these different parts of society within their own areas to try and ad address the issues that they face within their own areas? So we've got a challenge in terms of how we address it across the whole district, but also how we address it at a local area. And the council, within where I worked, identified with these district electoral areas. So they took the seven areas whereby councillors were elected from the particular areas and set up small committees within them areas so that they would be able to reach into the local communities, support the local communities, pull partnerships together with other public sector bodies, private sector bodies and communities to start to draw together plans which starts to fit and address the challenges of the local areas. So again, that's one of the, the, the big pieces of work that's been really done. And that then ties into the whole development of a community plan which will embrace the total council area. So the community plan can look at a cross-section of issues of how we provide an integrated level of services across the district council area, but also use the district electoral area plans to actually hone in in particular areas. So the issues which are important within your city in terms of unemployment and migration are the issues within the rural areas and the moorings where the environment and the, and the sea and the fisher, fishing villages and that they're important and how they can address these areas and can react quickly to it because that's what we have to do in local government. The very name it is local government, it's local and it connects locally. Uh, and I want to pick up maybe one of the issues in terms of how that is dealt with and how local government plays a critical, critical role in that. Uh, really from about 2000 on, the, the change in population within the Newry and Moran area, so in a, a major increase in, in migration. Indeed, we have roughly about 5% of our population are, are migrants, are new, are new citizens to the Newry and Moran area. And that's a major change within a rural, particularly rural area. But again, the council recognised that these new citizens that wanted to come and live in their area were going to be faced with challenges, not only in terms of employment, in terms of support, in terms of language issues, but also in terms of how they could integrate within their own communities. So the council, using its, its foresight and its role as civic leaders, actually embraced that and set, developed 
two or three programs to particularly tackle that. And maybe if we can pick that up. One of them is actually set up support hubs where they employed actually people from the ethnic communities who could translate and work with uh, their partners and with the council to actually provide a range of services. And in 2015, last year, they dealt with 1,600 cases from migrants who came into our area. So even though the, I know migration was at its peak roughly about 2007, 2008, there is still a big community and that connects to the community. One of the other issues they did was to actually look at how they could work with uh, other communities to embrace uh, the Polish, the Lithuanian, uh, the Russian communities into our own community and actually start to break down so that we didn't have any of the issues we had in terms of uh, sectarianism or racism within our own particular area. Again, using the communities to build up the, that diversity groups. And then thirdly, then actually looking at how they can engage with employers to provide work. So I suppose being a sister cities conference, I think what we can learn is we know that indeed we're twinned with Pinehurst and Southern Pines, which are small cities. Mm -hmm. But again, Newry's a small city when you compare it to Dublin or Belfast. But I think as cities, we can learn from each other and learn how we can address things and how we can localise everything to make sure that our communities are better connected to the issues and the challenges that, that we face throughout society and will continue to face. Because one thing we know is change is constant. That's absolutely true. Thank you very much, Liam. Thank you. And something very new that's happening with Sister Cities now are the refugees that are coming out of Syria. Because I know there's a lot of talk between um, the, our U.S. sister cities and our German uh, sister cities and some of our other European sister cities about how they can support each other as this is going on, which is a huge change in a lot of those communities. So, and talk about change and looking at societal issues, we have our Deputy Lord Mayor of Belfast, um, who is, I, should, I can say it, 24 years old. Okay, so he definitely brings the youth perspective to this, and um, so Guy, please. Yeah, Lord Mayor, Mayors, Deputy Mayors, uh, Delegates, um, good afternoon, and firstly can I say um, greetings from Belfast, we're just up the road, Belfast, Northern Ireland, and it's a real pleasure for me to be here today as Deputy Lord Mayor of the city, representing Belfast um, here at Croke Park, Dublin. Yeah, um, I guess when we're talking about addressing societal challenges, um, like many of you from cities gathered here and across the pond, um, we in Belfast um, have many internal um, challenges. And I guess the joys of being last on this panel is I can talk about the local issues and hopefully we do have um, a global solution. Um, one of um, Boston, our sister city's um, most beloved sons, John F. Kennedy, um, once famously said that efforts and courage are not enough without purpose and direction. And we in Belfast, again, face challenges such as homelessness on our streets, um, tackling poverty, bridging the skills gap, fostering a sense of belonging, as you had mentioned, to some of our immigrant and new ethnic minority communities. And again, um, continuing on the fantastic and tremendous achievements that have taken place in relation to peace and reconciliation across Northern Ireland. Um, and all of these societal challenges that I've mentioned, and many more, which I'm sure cities gathered here today face also, have helped us in Belfast form a strategy or an idea called the Belfast Agenda, which basically in short sets out our long-term plan or ambition to see where we as a city, Belfast, are in 2030. And already we've engaged with stakeholders across the city and even internationally, um, and we're starting to see some results take place. And one of the themes as part of that is trying to address poverty through inclusive, inclusive um, growth. Um, around 56 citizens, 56,000 citizens, in Belfast um, currently live in poverty. And one recent report noted that around 28% of children um, are affected by poverty. That rises when we take into account those children gathered in six of our worst deprived um, wards in, in the city. So I guess locally, Belfast, we, we have this challenge um, in terms of 
poverty and we, we're seeking to try and address it. Um, so we're working with the Joseph Roundry Foundation in trying to look at how we bridge the gap which was once siloed, which was economic growth and poverty. And we look at how we can join that up. 